Welcome to the Smokies and Wine podcast with JB and Jamie with the best guests, wine and chat. You know it makes sense. Sponsored by Clack and View Wealth Management, working with you today to plan for your tomorrow. Welcome to the latest edition of the Smokies and Wine podcast. Uh, very excited today. We have with us Rob Edwards from the company Wine and Something, who are one of our sponsors. And today we're sharing with them virtually, um, as me and Jamie are sharing it, the Malbec Morena, which have so far is, I have to say. It's absolutely delicious. Very nice. Cheers, Jamie. Thank you. And cheers, Rob. Thank you very much. Cheers. No pleasure to be on. You Very good glassware as well, which makes it, um, which makes it even better. There's nothing worse than a short stemmed or a tumbler when you when you've got a nice big full bodied red. Uh, nothing Ooh. worse than that. So yeah, good glassware. Full bodied. See that's yes, what you said earlier, JB. It's almost like a normal He's like a connoisseur. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. Anyway, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on. Um basically we want to talk about how the company was formed, you know, how you go about purchasing the wines, what you look for in particular. So we'll just start with yourself and Dale that, that formed the company two, three years ago. That's right. Yeah, we. Uh, it was February two thousand nineteen, and the business started. Um, I had a effectively a lifestyle business that was that was running before before this entity. Uh, I basically fell into wine in my finance life. I ended up working as a financial controller, which was initially going to be a, a temporary three month assignment for a, uh, a, um, a well known established uh, wine merchant in in Vauxhall in London. Um, ended up staying there for two years, loved every second. That was my introduction to wine. For me, it was a, a free for £10 from a supermarket job and feel very, very happy with myself. Um, the first day I worked at, um, I worked at Good House was a, uh, a Burgundy masterclass tasting. And I mean, it was they, they lined up in front of me. Um, you can go to the, uh, like seeing these mythical figures, something, a beacon went off in me and, and tasted the wine. And it was a case of, uh, I'm blind and now I can see. Um, and then on, I was completely obsessed with the industry and, and had two, two great years there, uh, left and just wanted to learn as much as I could. Um, and I guess the, the, the good thing from, well, the best thing about wine for me is, is it's kind of like science is you will never get to an end. There'll constantly be learning and producers doing different things and different techniques and producers popping up all over the place. Global warming is going to pay, play an impact on wine styles and what great varieties are going to grow in different areas. So yeah, for me, it's just that it was an endless, this endless monster that you can keep, you can keep kind of tasting your way through. Um, so I did that after I left and spent a good, good few years traveling and going to every masterclass that I could and tasting and drinking as much wine as I could. And just uh, kind of fell in love with the, the smaller producers, the quirky, the stories, the, the lesser known, the ones that um, kind of make wine from sort of heart and soul. And just saw a, a bit of a gap in the market, really, that there's an opportunity to bring these independent family estates in that are not already in the UK to give the give the consumer something a little bit different. Um, it started off as a lifestyle business, basically just made a few quid to fund my to fund my hobby. Sponsored a, a big event in London in June 18 uh, called Events in the Sky, which is effectively a Michelin star food served 100 foot up in the air in a crane right. above South Bank. Um, amazing concept, um, and that was that was owned, owned and managed by by Dale Egar, who's my my now business partner. So Dale exited that company and approached me and said, "Look, we got on well during this 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 few months partnership. I really like what you guys are doing." He's got a sales and marketing background, which is something I don't I don't have. I've got kind of finance ops and just a general wine lover. Um, so we we sort of spent a few months just just trying to work together and see if we'd come up with a common a common goal and that was effectively to bring these independent producers to the mainstream market so wine and something was effectively worn off the back of that um we started a new business rebranded basically went in a completely different direction than what i was before we wanted to create this commercial mass scale business but still keep true to to what got me into wine in the first place which was, was working with these colorful characters from all over the world that make amazing wines that people would not have come across. Um, so yeah, two years in, we're now fully e-commerce. So we're in wine for a website, we have partnerships with places like Vivino, which is going very well. And we also supply the on-trade. So there's, there's not many that kind of hybrid in that sense is normally a, a complete wholesale on-trade sure. B2B, or you have online 
or high street retail, which is purely B2C. Um, obviously, some of the larger companies can do both. But in, in our space, at our sort of level, there's not there's not many. So we, we have a big focus on on both. And yeah, two years in, it's been it's been a, a whirlwind. Obviously, COVID has had a massive uh, put a massive spanner in the works for for many in retail. Um, fortunately, most people drank their sorrows away during uh, <laughs> during lockdown. So uh, private sales throughout were were fairly steady. Um, but on trades, obviously, had a massive hit. But fortunately, Boris is going to let us out next week. So uh, we can uh, yeah, hit, carry on where we left off. Hopefully, from from an on trade perspective. So yeah, it's been a, been a fun. Fun five-year journey in wine, particularly these last two and a half years or so working with Dale and we've created something that we're really proud of and ready to uh, to get out onto mass market and have our bottles all over the country. How, how do you actually locate these small these small suppliers? Do you have to sort of dig deep to find them? or? Yeah, we have a, a very own master of wine slash truffle pig, uh, Robin Kick. Uh, so she's one of only 420-odd masters of wine in the world. Um, so a very elite group, one of the best palettes in the world. Her black book is extensive, um, as you can imagine. I actually worked with her at, at, at the merchants I worked for nine, ten years ago. She was a buyer and, and I was working in finance, but quite a small office. Everyone got involved in the whole wine side of it. Um, when a bottle was open from a salesman, everybody would have a glass. So we, we had a good good working relationship then, although not really working together. Um, and when I started uh, the, the previous entity, I wanted to go and, and, and find these producers. Uh, Robin was the first phone call that I made and she was delighted to have the opportunity to build a portfolio from scratch. So yeah, we, we travel the world. We go to, uh, we, we organize uh, tasting trips from Robin's um, contacts. We line up a load of producers that will go and visit over a period of time. We'll, we'll go to trade shows in, in certain areas. They're normally best to have under 200 producers in the same in the same building rather than having to, it'll take obviously 10, 20 times longer to, to travel around Italy and meet these guys. So a lot of trade shows are, are good avenues for us. We get a lot of incoming inquiries. Robin does a lot of research in publications. She was also a uh, very esteemed and respected judge and critic. So a lot, of, a lot of wine has fallen on her lap and she's always got part of her uh, wine and something hat on when, when these things come across. So it's, it's many, many multiple ways, really. But we generally have to uh, to invest a lot of time and effort into uh, in, into finding these producers because they're quite small. They don't necessarily have a big sort of marketing team, or some don't even have a website. Um, we realised with one one producer we worked with in uh, in Modena in in northern central Italy, we we organised a deal never exported anywhere before. Really excited to to get his wine out of Italy. Uh, we turned up in the well, not me personally, but our, our freight company turned up in a lorry and. He, had, he didn't even have an export license. He, hadn't, he didn't even know what paperwork needed to be done. It was it was a farcical, really. But yeah, three months down the line, we got the wine in. But um, yeah, these guys that have, have often have very or no sort of online presence. So it's, it's uh, kudos to Robin, and we're lucky to have him to be able to to call up uh, call up friends, locals, and say, look, what's what's new and up and coming? Who's not in the UK? Who should we be talking to? And fortunately, we've found a lot of um, a lot of really cool producers off the back of that. When you're going to the these shows, then what what does a wine have to do for you to make the cut to that you would want to supply it? Is there a particular thing you look for? Or yeah, I mean we we tend to work with kind of lower intervention, so not 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 natural wine. Natural wine is a different market. Natural wine has no no sulfur whatsoever, so it's literally vine to bottle with 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 zero intervention. There's big debates as to whether that's actually a commercial, a long term commercial wine or not because of the volatility of it um and then at the other end of the scale you get wines that are made in shipped in containers from australia and bottled in lincoln and distributed to every major retail all over the country that's obviously a different end of the scale so we try to work with producers that have a great story great brand is i think is quite important particularly as online an online business site is what people see they want to see something that that draws them in um obviously what's inside the bottle is 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 more important um, we just tend to look for something that's a good representation of of that style. We we don't necessarily. I think a lot of it's personal taste as well. We have to try and take that away from from to be objective when we're we're sourcing wine. But we don't as a, as a as a company we don't necessarily like wines that are just oaked to the point that the fruit has just completely disappeared. Some people want a Rioja and it's like chewing on bark. It's they're so 
so big, oaky, spicy, you actually take away the fruit. And an easy way to mask poor fruit is by oaking it or adding loads of bubbles. Oh, so right. for us, it's it's about finding a wine that has good fruit, good character, represents the the terroir, represents the the region, the great variety. Because if someone wants an Argentinian Malbec, you want to give them an Argentinian Malbec. You don't want necessarily something that's going to it's going to go against as as you're displaying now. Yeah, you, you don't want something that's going to go against what what someone expects. So um, yeah, it's, it's it also depends on the market we're looking at. If we're looking for something purely for restaurants, then or focused purely on restaurants, that's going to have a slightly different draw than something that's going to be direct to consumer and, and vice versa. But because we are a hybrid, we do offer our full list to restaurants um, and obviously our full list to private clients as well. But depending on what we bring in, is is generally on the focus as to where we think we can sell more of it but we, we just like lower intervention great great characters great story brand and a good representation of the the style of wine now you mentioned earlier and i, I didn't realize this but you said there's some big cup big operations bring it into the uk in a huge batch then bottle it in the uk yeah it's a lot of wine shipped in containers from particularly from the southern hemisphere if you look on the bottle of, I'm not going to, I'm not going to name brands, but if you, if you look on the bottle of some mass-produced brands, it will be imported by bottle at. It's just, just such a massive operation to ship millions of bottles. It's just much easier to ship it in containers. And these, these are not. It's not like a P and O container with a big lock on the front. Obviously, they're adapted specifically, specifically for wine. Um, but to last that journey, it's it, it needs additives and it needs preservatives to uh, to make it last and often I'm, I'm quite sensitive to sulfur personally so if I drink wine in a bar that I don't necessarily know I could I, I feel it in terms of kind of headaches fairly quickly so um, we, 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 as I said, we don't do natural wine we have producers that, that use small amounts of sulfur but it's, it's kind of just just to just to guide it in the right path the net, rather than necessarily to to preserve it for a period of time or, or make it bomb proof it's just um just gives it that stability and and just makes it a bit more commercial would that contribute to sometimes the raging hangovers i get the next day uh, volume as well does that <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not saying that if you drink three bottles of one of our wines you'll, you'll wake up fresh as a daisy in the morning no, no, but, no, i know that but um no it can do yes like, like i said salt sulfur to me gives me a headache um right. even even just drinking in, in, in the bar at that point um yeah dehydration is is the main the main reason yeah, yeah, so yeah. if you if you're going to have a good bottle then you obviously feel a lot better but you need to make sure you have a a good uh, a good few glasses of water alongside it oh well aren't there good tips already thank you there you go that's all right Pleasure. is that is that only added to red wine or is that added to white wine as well no both no you, you add you can add sulfur to uh, to anything it's um it's kind of a, a natural, a natural preservative, but within within limits has no impact on the human body whatsoever. Completely, completely sound. Obviously, in larger quantities, then it has an impact. And some people have have no impact whatsoever. But those that are a bit more sensitive to sulfur, some people have sulfur allergies, so stick to stick to natural wines. There's a natural, so there's a natural element of it in the wine anyway, but most just limit how much addition they add to to the winemaking process. You touched on our glasses earlier on, saying that there were nice glasses for drinking this particular wine. There's obviously the big, not debate, but all the, there must be about eight to 10 different types of glasses that people say, use this for that type of wine, use something else for another type of wine. Is there any tips you could give out to people that just would, you know, just sitting in their living room just to enhance their normal drinking of, of a wine that they would buy, regardless of where it's from, just something that would enhance the experience? Yeah, for, for me, it's about surface area. I think the more surface area you've got in a glass, the more the wine's going to open up and be more expressive. Um, like champagne you see in every every Hollywood movie and in every image of a cocktail party, you've got these champagne flutes that are long, thin. There's no surface area. You don't actually get much expression. And I, I find the bubbles to be a little bit more condensed and more, um, just find it more gassy when you, you drink out of a flute. You see in the... Uh, probably the 40s 50s movies where they have the uh the little um kind of thin thin round top with a long stem that's probably more appropriate for, for champagne that's, oh, that's I, the old uh, baby sham glasses that yeah, i grew exactly, up with yeah, 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 yeah. exactly yeah no uh that's it's got surface area you see and I, I i tend to drink champagne out of a good white wine glass anyway because just enhances that 
that profile, you just get more, just more expression out of it, really. And and I I think if you if you spend twenty twenty five pounds on a bottle of wine, you should spend twenty twenty five pounds on a glass as well. I think it's it's obviously it has its limits. I mean, if you're a Chateau Lafitte ninety eight drinker, then I don't think you'll find a glass at a thousand pounds unless you are <laughs> from a museum somewhere. But um, yeah, I think if you if you're going to spend good money on wine, I think you need to spend good money also on a glass. And yeah, for me, surface area is really important. I like a I like a big big rounded um big rounded bottom i'm talking about talking about wine glasses uh like a big rounded bottom big big area at the top and it's just um yeah just just gets the gets the profiles get the flavors and the expressions out in a lot more detail i think you you, you use a a thicker thicker glass smaller smaller stem smaller um smaller top i just don't think you get much much from it really and obviously the aroma is the first first part of the process obviously you look at the wine. You can look at the colours. See if, see if you can see any oak contact. If there's any um, like light, lighter reds, darker reds, you can you can tend to see sort of varieties and and wine making process through the appearance. But the first thing that really gets you gets the juices flowing is when you is when you put your nose in there and take a take a good sniff. And um, for me, you you get that with with a, with a much better glass. So I, yeah, I'm a big advocate of of, um, of glassware. I, I brew glasses at home, and I would recommend anyone does the same and don't overfill the glass don't be lazy and think i'll just fill it right to the top exactly no i think little is little is best um with a big glass anyway it doesn't look like a lot but you you can get yeah. you can get a fair amount in there um you yeah, know just particularly with red wine it's not the more the more you you leave it to open up the better and while it's in the glass it's still opening up the bottle's open as well while you're while you're drinking it it's just it's just going to add to that um add to that expression and, and add to that experience We've even decanted ours here. People say that you um you only have to decant a good wine. I don't I don't believe that at all. And, and people say you don't decant white wine. Again, I don't agree with that because with an oaked white, you know, there's there's obviously a lot a lot in there to come out. And I, I, I would decant a nice a nice oaked Chardonnay, for example. Um, I'd leave that for for twenty minutes, half an hour. Bring it down not to room temperature, but take that take that chill off because um, with oak oaked wine. I think it, need, it needs that it needs it needs that temperature to come down because it can be very close. I think a lot of white wine tends to be drunk really cold, um, yeah. and it just closes it just closes up. Um, even Sauvignon Blanc, which is a very expressive grape, when you chill it too much, you can you can you can kind of lose that that aroma and that uh, that passion fruit, pineapple, mango that you expect from from Sauvignon Blanc. So obviously it depends on some. Some wines you you just want the colder the better, and depends on the where you are, what you what you're eating, and who you're with. But I think white wines do do benefit from, especially the more expressive varieties do benefit from from a slight drop in temperature, uh, sorry, slight rise in temperature, and um, and a bit of decanting will do them no harm whatsoever. Yeah, just not straight from the fridge. Yeah. No, exactly. I think twenty minutes, half an hour, just to just to take that edge off. Same with champagne. Uh, actually, when you go to when you go to the champagne region, they 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 don't even chill it. It's literally just left there. There's no ice buckets. It's just left at left at that temperature because um, yeah, it just just gives you a lot. And who makes the final decision then on what wines that you stock? Is it you, you all taste it and then sort of discuss it, or you take Robin's recommendations, or how how does that work? Um, it would be very silly not to take the suggestion of one of the best palates in the world. Um, <laughs> she, she's She's there for a reason. Um, we do we do overall to some extent because look, Robin's brilliant, but she she's a purist. She 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 adores everything that she does, and she sees it from a very wine perspective, which is exactly what we want from her. Um, and we wouldn't change that. But obviously, we in the office here we have to see it as a commercial opportunity. If really, if we saying. see this as a wine that we can sell a lot of to as a house wine in a bar. We can sell two thousand bottles a year. We're going to buy it. Be, it's, 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 it's right up our right up our street. Um, but we we do we do run every every wine past Robin, and we if there's any kind of clash or or a difference of opinion, we tend to just discuss it and we 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 agree a way forward. But yeah, a majority. Robin has Robin has the input, and what what we tend to do is rather than us in the office tasting a huge amount of wine. We tend to get all samples directed to Robin. She'll then taste, and then she'll select the ones that she particularly enjoyed and thinks will suit us. And then in the office, we'll then taste those that have already been filtered, if you like. 
um, and at that point we we make a decision. But it's 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 good that way because it, um, we we know that everything there is it, everything that arrives is going to be of a good of a good quality, and then it's just us to decide where whether we think we can sell it or how much we think we can sell of a certain wine, where we can pitch it, um, and then we make that decision. But yeah, Robin has a ninety nine percent play in terms of in terms of what we buy. Sounds like a dream job, but are you drinking wine every day? We taste wine. Oh, we, we do. We do. This is my favourite phrase. Are you spitting or swallowing? When we go on sourcing trips, I mean, we people say, like you, you said it there, you've got the best job in the world. I've got friends of mine that don't really know anything about wine. I mean, it wasn't an industry I grew up in, so they don't really know what I do, to be honest. Um, but when I say I'm off to uh, I'm off to Burgundy for a week tasting, it's, like, oh, it's just a massive jolly, and it? it's, like, <laughs> it's not work, is it? I said, come with me, come with me, and and see. And somebody came with me who gave me the gave me all this grief about being a massive jolly and eating and drinking your way through France. They they had a newfound respect by the end of it because I mean you'd wake up at six o'clock in the morning, you'd you'd have generally have no coffee because it can, it can obviously burn your palate. You tend to have flavourless toothpaste. No orange juice, nothing too acidic. So you're there with a, a croissant and maybe a, maybe an espresso if you can uh, if you can make sure it's of a decent temperature. First tasting at eight o'clock in the morning, standing in cold cellars or or around tasting tables. Meet three or four producers before lunch. Quick lunch, back out again in the afternoon. Maybe maybe have a glass at lunch just as a as a reward for for a stressful morning. Um, again, four or five producers in the afternoon. Sit down for dinner. Obviously, the English we love dinner around six o'clock. The Mediterranean's nine ten o'clock. Yeah, they say um, I've got friends in Italy, and they say that's when the chickens eat. Yeah, exactly. No, it's true. We're, we we're, we're coming. We're stumbling home drunk just as the locals are going out to eat. I think that's why we have such a bad reputation abroad as a as a, as a nation that likes to drink. They just catch us at the wrong time. <laughs> um, so yeah, you sit down for dinner at eight nine o'clock, and there's normally producers there or or or, or guests, and that goes on until till 12 o'clock you've had a, a bottle bottle and a half of wine with dinner and then wake up at six and go again and you do this for four or five days in a row i just i just can't wait to get home and have some boiled fish and vegetables and go to bed at eight it's um it does it does uh we're soldiers basically is what i'm trying to say we are <laughs> yeah, we are soldiers you're not selling that to me mate four or five days <laughs> yeah, come yeah, with I'm, us come with I'm us and you know, so, you know, it's uh <laughs> Oh, hang yes, on. It's, uh, got an invite there. did you just say come with us <laughs> i did i did yeah I did. Uh, no, it's um. Obviously, I, I love it. It's just I wouldn't want to be doing anything else. But it's it's long days. It's, it take takes its toll after after four or five days. And if you if you're tasting a hundred wines a day, you, you definitely have to spit. And also, you, your palate kind of you do get palate fatigue by the end of the day. Everything just you just kind of lose lose just, all of the. It just all tastes the same. Is that sort of? Yeah, what I mean. I, with Burgundy anyway, it's all Pinot Noir. So you, you take 100 Pinot Noirs, it's when you get to number 50 and you're writing notes in a little less cherry <laughs> or a, a little bit more spice. Like you, you don't really know what, what to get to. And it, it does, you, your palate does give up by by late on in the day and, and you lose that, you lose the impact of wine by the end of it and you just, you just, it's had enough. And then, but as soon as you wake up in the morning, you, you can't wait to get to the next appointment. So uh, it's, a, it's, a great, it's a great place to be in, but yeah, it's, it's not it's not all champagne and skills. It's, uh, it's... You said you, you you obviously meet some really interesting characters when you're on all these travels. Have you any stories from your from your travels around the world looking at these independent wineries? Yeah, I mean these are these are husband wife and dog scenarios a lot of them. And uh, we went to actually one of the first trips. Um, we went went through Tuscany. That was kind of our first our first tasting trip, and went we went with a friend of mine who. Uh, He's an Italian fanatic. If I didn't take him, he'd be we'd, we'd, we would never speak again. He, he loves it. Um, so he came with me, and we went to a, a place just outside Florence called San Gimignano, which is famous for a white Tuscan wine called uh, Vernaccia, Vernaccia di San Gimignano. Not not overly commercial, but you do find it in the UK. Nice, aromatic, fresh, crisp, kind of like Pinot Grigio, but just elevated. It's much more much more expressive. Lovely wine, good good value. Um, and we met these two brothers. We we kind of packed these appointments in like an hour and a half each one, just so we can spend a bit of time, but also set a limit before we leave, so that they know oh, we've got an hour until we have to go half an hour to the next place. So we got to this place. Two brothers said, so "We we've got an hour. Fine, no problem." Went through, met the dad. He came out carrying buckets and buckets of fruit and vegetables from the farm. 
kept us talking for 10, 20 minutes. When he sat, when he saw the winery, the wife was there, she was telling us all these stories. He said, oh, we'll go upstairs for a wine tasting. We went up, he had all these wines laid out. The the, the aunt or his wife's sister was was making rabbit stew and, and um, all these plates of meat and cheese and said, you must, you must eat something while you taste with us. Cut a long story short, we were there for four and a half hours. Um, <laughs> and these, these two brothers were, we, we were, we were teaching them about Essex girls. They were, uh, uh -huh. he was telling us that he lied to his wife for five years, that he was a vegetarian just so that he could, uh, he'd get her on the side and he'd wake up at 11 o'clock at night when she went to bed and go down and stuff his face full of Palmer ham and, uh, and, and cured meats. Um, and we, we just had the best afternoon. And in that, in that environment, it's a really important thing because when, when you're in that environment, the wine tasted incredible. It's like this wine is, is us in a nutshell. We, we love this wine. We love these guys. We were just joking and laughing for, we missed two appointments afterwards. We were literally just, just there for the afternoon having the best time. And then the good thing about Robin is she takes that emotion out of it and she's, she's there tasting the wine on her own in that environment. And she said, these, these wines are not, and not for us. And I was devastated because obviously these guys, we had such a best time. We, we were like talking about spending Christmases with each other. Um, and then you had to, uh, you had to drop them a note and say, look, had a great time, but really sorry that it's, um, it's not for us. So it just, to, when you, it just shows how much of a, an impact the environment and the people you're with and the atmosphere can have on, have on the wine. You've probably done it as well. You've probably been on, been to a restaurant in, in the Mediterranean or somewhere abroad, you've had this amazing bottle of wine. You've then found it back in England and you've had that same bottle of wine again. And it's like, it's not as good as I remember. Yeah. Um, it's just that, that, that emotion makes a massive difference. So we, uh, a lot of stories of, yeah, long boozy lunches and, um, yeah, there's, there's just some, some, um, amazing characters that you, that just love what they do and there's no pretension around it. It's come and see my winery and that could be anything from a, a table outside to an amazing underground cellar beneath their house um we had a champagne producer we work with called champagne Corban. she has a beautiful french style house finds back onto the house this beautiful cellar underneath like the art brick arches we ended up picking bottles from our birth years we went upstairs and listened to eurovision's greatest hits while talking about snooker and drinking some vintage <laughs> champagne from our birthday you don't get that on a on a, a lauren perrier tasting so uh, yeah this, this is what this is what we love and these stories obviously help us with help us with selling because we do virtual tastings as well now during, during lockdown we've done face-to-face -face tastings before that for, for private and corporates and events where we, we do portfolio tastings and we can talk to people and when you tell these stories they, they immediately get this sort of affiliation with with the wine and then it's about them taking that wine to their friends and telling that story again so I think it's people are really concerned about provenance and where where their, where their things are coming from not just wine but food furniture clothing you see on um, a lot of supermarkets now sell, sell fish packed. It tells you what boat it was caught on and what date and yeah. the, uh, the shoe size of the fishermen that caught it. Like it's, everyone, people love that that story now. I think there's a big shift over the last 10, 15 years. So we, we, we've got lots of stories and we just, we love we love telling it and our customers buy into that. So it's, um, it's really important. You obviously travel around Europe. Have you traveled further afield, you know, South America, anything like that? Yeah, so we did done Chile, um, which is a beautiful country, top to bottom. Uh, amazing wine, good value. Um, we, the last trip we actually took before COVID, uh, Dale and I were in San Francisco. So we went to Napa and Sonoma Valley, which are obviously two big, two big wine regions of the US. Um, yeah, we'll arm at Valley in Oregon. We have a producer who've been up there to see them. Dale is South African. Um, it's not his fault, don't hold it against him, but he, uh, <laughs> uh, he was born there. So I knew a lot about South African wine from, from growing up. Um, I was due to go in July last year, but COVID has affected that. So we'll be down there soon. Uh, but yeah, mostly Europe and, and that was the main focus, but um, yeah, we've done Australia, um, yeah, South America parts of the US where, where wine grows. So, um, yeah, and COVID dependent, hopefully we can, can get back out there and, and, and do a bit more in the new world because obviously I'm going to say the B word, um, because Brexit has obviously, uh, it's had an impact on wine coming in from the EU in terms of cost. Um, there's additional costs involved in, in customs clearance and duties to bring wine in. So we don't have that with the new world. So. It's quite cost it's quite good value anyway wines from from argentina and chile and south africa so we need to probably put a bit more focus on on wines from those regions as well that we can we can keep at a really good 
price point for the customer. I mean, we're not talking pounds on top of bottles from Europe, but um, there are additional costs that we ultimately we, we have to pass on, or we or we need to go to the producer and say, look, can you can you help us to com- to, to ensure the wine stays competitive because there's only so much someone will pay for yeah uh, for a sancerre. Like they, they they have an expectation of what it should be, and if you have to put that one or two one or two pounds, it has to be either exceptional or um, it's going to price itself out. So we're lucky to work with some really good understanding producers as well that want to work in the UK and they know how important it is for them to have a presence in the UK. So um, we've managed to get a bit of support from them. Obviously, Brexit also impacted the pound initially and we lost 15% of our, our value overnight. I was actually in, um, in Veneto in Italy during that time um, and was there in the hotel as uh, as Farage celebrated, and uh, yeah, my hotel bill went up fifteen percent the next morning, and a few awkward awkward uh, awkward tastings that day as well. That was uh, that was a fun, that was a fun time to be alive. So you mentioned uh, about Robin uh, taking the emotion out of things when she's doing her tastings compared to yourself, and I think that gets to the heart of everything, which is it's about the experience you have when you're when you're enjoying your night out, whether that be wine, whether it be anything else. Some of our best nights out might not have been drinking the best wine but we've had the best experience when we've been out and I think that's what you're trying to do with your virtual wine tastings is almost create an experience for people um is, is that right or how, how do these virtual yeah. tastings work yeah no, exactly you know we, we we don't want to blind people with science because um like I, I, I fell in love with with the stories the characters the brands around wine it's not I don't necessarily I mean I I, I know but I don't necessarily feel the need to ask every producer the ph levels and, and how long it's yeah. been doing its thing it's, for me it's just about understanding a little bit more about the wine breaking that barrier keeping it onto a point where people can understand you're not kind of going over their head too much um and just talk just talk through the wine with them and and and, and educate them in a way that is um is less intensive and we try to keep them quite um Quite jovial. We have a presentation we go through, but it's all just like interesting facts from the region, some nice images. Um, but the, the, it's about the wine at the end of the day. I mean, for us, it's about and contact is massive during during COVID. I mean, people are crying out for um, for social contacts. So if we can get five or six households on a call, tasting the same wine, telling people what what aromas they're getting, and and they learn a little bit about the producer, um, and they have a good evening. This this is. It's, um, that's, that's what it's about. It's just about removing any pretension away from wine and just just giving people something different and, and giving them some knowledge and some stories that, that we have in abundance that we, we just love we just love sharing. And for me, I, I really enjoy them. It's, um, um, it's, why, it's why we do it. And the more you can, I can talk to people about wine until the cows go in. And I've bored people to tears in, in, uh, at times, yeah. but um, if you're passionate about something, then when you obviously portray that, you, you talk to people in, in this format, it comes across really well. And um, yeah, we we've, we've, uh, we started them towards the end of March. So we do weekly weekly tastings, various topics. We, we've recently done a Stellan Bosch. Uh, the French Connection was, was uh, last week. We, that was over two parts, as, as most are. And yeah, we have Italian, Spanish, uh, some from the West Coast, so Oregon, California, uh, Champagne and Friends. We, we also work with my, my good friend who makes his salami. Um, so we do a wine and salami matching. We also work with a chocolatier in Sussex, uh, husband and wife team, make amazing uh, single origin chocolates that we pair with We pair with wine. So yeah, for, on the website, you can see the full calendar of, of all of our virtual tastings. And not even in normal times, I think people have realized this is it's quite a fun thing to do on a Thursday afternoon without yeah. having to uh, find babysitters and, and and get doled up. It's uh, it's an hour hour on a Thursday night where you can enjoy enjoy wine with good company and 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 earn a little bit. I like the way you package things up on the website as well. You know, you've got those the, the gift box type of things. You know, lads' night in poker nights, karaoke nights, the old games night, all these sorts of things, which. I've not seen on other websites before. It maybe happens, but I haven't seen it. Um, was that who was the brains behind that? Um, I'd like to say me, but no, it's, it's all day with that. That's uh, that's the uh, the sales and marketing coming through. But we're, we're, although we've got very different backgrounds in terms of experience, we're both aligned with with the brand and how far it can go. Obviously, wine and something. The something could be we've not just forgot what that word is. It's it's it's, it's um it could be anything. So we wanna we wanna make sure that. 
the brand is the brand is endless. So we've got like wine and poker, wine and singing your hearts out, wine and yeah. friends, wine and whatever. It's, it's an endless it's an endless brand. And I think just having obviously we're not expecting people to order a wine and poker mixed case just because they're going to have a poker night but it's just having these kind of themes it sure. just brings these wine into people's everyday lives and and the brand that we want to create is is inclusive across the board and it's um it's open-ended in terms of how far we can how far we can take the brand and that was the biggest challenge is is finding a brand that suits us that also stands out from the crowd um, not everyone will get it but i think when you when you do, I think it is an instant connection, and you you want to see what's going to come next. Um, so no, we, we're really happy, we're really proud of the website. We're proud of the the way it looks and feels. And there's some additional development going in. We're going to be launching a, a really cool concept in the next six weeks or so, which will hopefully be a big play for us. Um, but yeah, as I said there's there's endless opportunities to take the brand forward, and and uh, it just gives us a lot of scope to be creative and have some fun. And finally, for anyone listening out there that thinks, why would I come onto the website and order wine rather than going to my local supermarket, wherever that may be, what what will they get slightly differently from you that they wouldn't maybe get at the supermarket? Um, the, the customer service, I think, throughout our business is, is exceptional. Um, our our um, trust pilot reviews are 100% five-star. People love what we do. So I think our customer service is fantastic if you're – if you're unsure of what wines you're looking for, what you're serving for dinner, there's a lot of a lot of information on our website that you can sort sort wines by, and you can also drop us a note on chat or email. And we've got people that can guide you in the right place. Um, obviously, these these are brands that are not 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 in the UK. Ninety percent of our portfolio is exclusive to us, so there's wines that you won't find anywhere. Um, and like I said, these are wines that are lovingly made. They're procured by one of the best palates in the world, um, and whether it's your style or not, you know you we know. That whatever wine goes on your table is an excellent representation of that because as i said it's been rubber stamped by one of the best in the industry yeah well, i i just ordered a case of wine off you last week and the whole system is just silky smooth i thought it was excellent and i've had one of the bo- i've had one of the bottles so far and that was excellent as well so yeah good thank you no i'm, I'm glad thank you and in addition to that, anyone listening, if you use our code SMOKIES10, you get an additional 10% off whatever the normal price is that you're, that you're offering it at, which is, again, a good, a good saver oh, for people. Great deal, yeah. Great deal. And that also includes tastings as well. So if, you, if you, it's across any, any, any wine or, or service. We're also running a promotion at the moment with uh, one of our, actually our first producer that we ever took on in Tuscany called Caras Vinny. Um, so for every bottle that you buy of Caras, you go into a draw to win a trip to Tuscany hosted it's by that, yeah. the owner of Caras in September. COVID permitting, obviously it may, may, it may, it may have to move down the line, but the tour will happen um, and it's for free people. All expenses paid, um, three days in Tuscany, just, just for ordering. For, so for every bottle you get an entry. Um, so just, just one bottle of Caras puts you in, in with a chance of winning. So um, you can you can do what we do in terms of spending time with these producers and, and seeing seeing the best of uh, of what off the track wine world can give you. I'll have to go back to your website because Tuscany is amazing. I'm wanting to go there. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's also it outlines day by day what will happen as well on the website. You know, it just does trip. give you a good itinerary on yeah. there. No, it's a great trip. Speaking of trips, COVID stopped it, but we are hoping to get down and meet you guys face to face and get a little look around. The, the factory, et cetera, and it, when that will happen, we're still not entirely sure if things are still a, bit, a little bit up in the air. But uh, until then, thank you so much for coming on. That's given us a great insight to even more to what you do. Hopefully it's given people out there a good insight to what you do and how they can get an excellent wine from you. Right, no, it's good to chat. Really nice to meet you. Thank right, you. Thank you, thank you, Rob. Thanks all and right. all the best. Cheers. Bye. You've been listening to the Smokies and Wine podcast. Sponsored by Clack and View Wealth Management, working with you today to plan for your tomorrow.